12 people had died. So many of these things have been talked about on cover of Time Magazine, National Geographic, and so on and so forth, New York Times, Washington Post, MSNBC, blah, 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 about the kids, about the lid, blah, blah, blah. But the untold story about the poisoning of a whole city is the emergency manager system, the emergency manager law that was passed in 2011 in the state of Michigan. See, it's a political story alongside this toxic water story. And the politics is the story I bring to you today because that's the story that's not being told. That in 2011, Rick Snyder, current governor of the state of Michigan, signed into law a bill, Public Act 4, called the Emergency Manager Law. That was a law that allowed the governor to send an individual into a city or municipality or school district, and that individual would assume all the powers of your local government. And somebody said, now what did she say? That person would replace your local elected official. It would replace, that person replaces your mayor. That person replaces your city council or your city commissioners. Their powers are set aside and put in the hands of one person called the emergency manager. That is what is going on in Michigan in 17 school districts and municipalities. And that is the system under which we were living when the button was pushed in April of 2014 that put us on the Flint River water. There were no public hearings asking citizens that they want to go to the river. There was no process for your city council to veto the decision of the emergency manager. Once the emergency manager does something or orders something, you cannot reverse their decisions. That's why we call it dictatorship. Your city council can't reverse it. Your public comments won't reverse it. Your mayor can't reverse it. Those decisions are etched in stone. And that decision that was etched in stone poisoned our city. This is the untold story about the Flint mess. It's a, so what we say is, we got a water problem, but we got a dictator problem too. We got a democracy problem. And there's no daylight in between our lead laden water and the system of emergency management that brought us to that. So that's what I want to share with you today, a story of bad water and bad politics in the state of Michigan. What on earth is the purpose of having a person to come into your city and replace the people you elected and the mayor you elected? What is the purpose of that? Well, here's a very nutshell purpose, and we could do a whole lecture on that, but we're going to put it in a nutshell. This is an attempt by corporate interests and bondholder interests to steal the assets from a city or municipality. Now let me give you an example of what I mean. The water, and some of you may have heard that water is the new oil, but one of the most precious assets of a city is their water and their water treatment facilities. But you got corporate interests out there that want to get their hands on that water. They want to get their hands on that water treatment plant. They want to take that over. And rather than 
negotiating with the city or the people of that city to hand over water, their water treatment plant and their water rights, they send the emergency manager in and all he got to do is sign the order and make it happen. So in their zeal and on their way to the cha-ching uh, jackpot store, and here we are in Michigan with all those great lakes, the largest basin of fresh water in the world, and we sitting up in here poisoned, and not only is the water undrinkable, it's, we can't afford it. It's too expensive. So on the way to the, like I say, on the way to the bonus jackpot for corporate interests and bondholders, we got poison on their way to the payday while they try to build new, a new pipeline. No, we just gonna put y'all on that water while we build a new pipeline. We can't afford to pay for Detroit water. That's where we used to get our water from, Detroit. But they decide, let's go on the river and give them some water till we build a new pipeline. Now, we were put on that water in April 2014. In October 2014, that same year, just a few months later, here come General Motors. General Motors, Flint is the home of General Motors. We put, we put, we put uh, wheels on, on the road in America. We built General Motors. So, General Motors come along and says this to the emergency manager, not to the mayor, not to the council, not to the citizens of the city of Flint. They go to the emergency manager, this one man dictator, and say to him this, that water, that Flint water is resting our parts. This water, y'all didn't hear me, that water was resting engine parts. They let General Motors return to Detroit water. They wouldn't let the people return to the Detroit water. So we are living in an era, we're living in a time where in Flint, we're like a lot of Rust Belt cities. We once had great manufacturing jobs, union jobs, now we're at 42% poverty. What is being created here as we enter into a new era of technology and electronic production, a lot of people is being left by the wayside. The people that's being left by the wayside is a class of disposable people. They're not needed anymore. We don't need you in the production process. You just collateral damages. Oh, you got poison? Oh, well. And we have been, every level of government has failed us because we are not, that's how come I got on this shirt. Flint Lives Matter. Flint lives matter to the Flint people, to the good people, for our humanity. But our lives do not matter to corporate interests. Our lives do not matter to the EPA. Our lives do not matter to the DEQ. Our lives do not matter to the governor. Our, do not, do, our lives do not matter to corporate interests. And this is what we are up against, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, and boys and girls. And we all got a stake in the future of what happened to the Flint people. Because trust me, we was abandoned at every level of government. Let me show you how. This was in an EPA memo published recently because of those hearings they had in Washington. This is what, a, what the EPA memo said. This is the federal. Quote, I'm not so sure Flint is the community we want to go out on a limb for. That's after they discovered there was lead in the water. That was their comment. 
our governor in a dip deposition in court because Flint retirees who work for the city is suing the state of Michigan because they don't want to pay for their health care all of a sudden. You worked all your life. You retired with health care. Now they want to come along and, and take it away. And they were referring to these retirees. And they said, well, we can't afford to pay health care for these retirees because we need that money to pay for fire and police because this is the words of the governor. Flint is murder town. He called our city murder town after they poisoned 100,000 people, you call us murder town. The emergency manager that we had at the time down there early, when he was confronted while he was there about, why would you let General Motors go back to Detroit as a water source after it's rusting their parts and think we as human beings supposed to be using this water. Why would you do that? Why can't we go back to the Detroit water source? Here's what he said, and I quote, well, that's apples and oranges. Apples and oranges. One is metal and the other is people. Apples and oranges. So this is the mindset and the attitude that we've had to deal with. But once again, I want to go back to the big picture of the system of emergency management. Because 17 cities and school districts live under that in the state of Michigan. And there's two driving forces for emergency management. They want someone to go into these cities. They want them to go in there and sell off the public assets the public assets that we have built, the working class has built these assets, and we have maintained them all these years, and they can send someone in there to sell these assets off to corporate interests, and the emergency manager is the tool du jour. <laughs> That's the weapon of the day. That's the high-tech high robbery in the emergency management system a dictatorial system. Many cities that had emergency managers have been devastated by these people stealing the public comments. In Pontiac, Pontiac, Michigan was recently let go from the crooks of the state and they got their city back, but there's not much city left. Their fire department is gone, went to the county. Police department, gone, went to the county. Water department, privatized, is gone. Emergency manager. The Silver Dome Stadium that the Detroit Lions used to play in, built in the 70s, $55 million taxpayers, state of Michigan taxpayers money helped to build it. The Silver Dome. It was called a state of the art way ahead of its time. They called the Silver Dome the eighth wonder of the world. The emergency manager sold the Silver Dome for $500,000. So that was an asset that belonged to the city of Pontiac. And now that the state has left Pontiac, it's just a shell of its former self. We don't even know why they even got a city council because there's nothing to oversee there. Everything has been stolen and put into the hands of county or private public partnerships and the rest of it. The other driving force of an emergency manager is certainly union busting to privatize all your city services. In the city of Flint, we have beautiful, and still do, we have beautiful, bright red garbage trucks that we purchase, and shortly after we purchase, the, the emergency manager served, sold the trucks and the workers to a private company. 
republic. They took it right from under the hands of the citizens of Flint, out of our hands. But we still got a garbage fee we paying. But it's not going into the public job. It's going to a private company. And so this is the whole driving force of emergency managers to fast track the privatization, to fast track union busting, to fast track selling your assets. And I could tell you some more stories, but I won't hold you up with that. But this is a lesson and a call, a wake up call for everyone across the nation to see this political model come into being. Nowhere in this country do you have this form of dictatorial powers taking over cities and municipalities. And they're doing it with school districts as well. But I'm gonna just end up, because we've got other speakers, by saying that some of the activists and some of the movement to resist the emergency manager have culminated in some people catching cases as a result. And one that you may or may not have heard of, the Reverend Edward Pickney out of Benton Harbor, was we're going home. When I go back to Michigan this coming Wednesday, he has a court date in Grand Rapids of Michigan to, Michigan to appeal his case. He was given three to 10 years with absolutely no evidence accused of voter fraud. But we know what the uh, intent was there to hush the site. They, they want to hush him, to silence him as a leader and hope that the movement is go away, but it only makes the movement stronger. We have Eric Mays, one of our councilmen in Flint. He's been a loud, outspoken advocate for the people and against emergency management. He's been victimized. We have Gertrude Marshall. She had a bullhorn down there at the Flint market. Uh, she was calling out for safe water and she caught a case of disorderly. Then you've got the Homrich Nine out of Detroit, Michigan. They're also in the hooks of the state. They have been turning off people's water at an alarming rate. You wouldn't believe the thousands and thousands of people whose water been turned off in Detroit. The, Uni the United Nations came into Detroit year before last to call out the city for this outrageous situation. But since they left, the, str the struggle has escalated and there were nine individuals who stood in front of the trucks that go out and turn people's water off and they are in the, in the uh, middle of their trial and their uh, situation. So I just want to share the story a little bit, give you a, a profile of what's happening in Michigan because what we say is this, what happens in Michigan won't stay in Michigan unless the people in this country wake up and sound the alarm. So thank you very much. So I'd like, to, I'd like to add three little factoids for your pleasure. One, there are now 19 states in the United States that have emergency manager laws similar to this, 19. It is spreading. Two, the Port of, uh, the Port of Oakland has sold Jack London Square to a private owner. Three, Kaiser Auditorium, public for 100 years. Is Randolph, is it sold? in the process of being sold to a private developer. So if we don't think it's coming here, it's here, folks. So at this time, we have a panel presentation featuring voices from our community. We'll hear from Laney student, Alicia Alston. Hold up your hand, Alicia. <laughs> community representative, Brittany Brown of the East 12th Street Coalition that have been fighting off the sale of the 12th Street parcel next to Laney, and Laney faculty member, Dr. Kimberly King. Show them your hand, Kimberly. I believe we were going to have the student or the community rep go first. Who, who's on, okay, on deck. 
Well, as Professor Peter Brown stated, um, my name is Alicia Alston. I am part of the ASLC Senate here at Laney College. And just to piggyback off what he said, we're talking about, he's talking about the gentrification around here. Um, it's, it's, it's horrible. It's one of the worst things here in Oakland and California in general. Um, and we also have like, there are some issues here on campus, but I'm gonna keep that pretty short. But we know about our, um, like, I uh, wanna, um, wanna talk about our water here on campus and the water fountains. It's considered acidic. And with this water on this campus, we could, it could get a lot worse. It could look just like the water did in Flint. So if you guys weren't paying attention to that video, I, per, I definitely would, um, would suggest you take a, another look at that, because that can happen, what's happening there can happen here. As far as a student's perspective, there's a lot of things that, um, that I know I've been going through as far as education is our biggest deal also. We are losing our, you know, we're losing our, um, our, our funding. We want to keep our tuitions for UCs um, available. They're raising tuitions. They're raising our fees here on, on, in the community colleges also. So a lot of students like me, I have to use the BOG fee waiver. That's our main thing for students who are low income. But now they're changing it where if you don't have a 2.0 or you haven't completed your 50% of coursework, you're going on academic suspension. And that's not a good thing. We need that. We also definitely need that. And we need to keep more instructors part-time instructors, give them the, give them the, get, hopefully we can get the fact that they can get the full-time office hours that they need. Because we as students, we need to meet with our instructors. We definitely need that support. So as far as like the gentrification, you definitely get with your city council, get with your, you know, get them, go to those offices, go, go let, if you got something you want to say, let them know that you don't want this to happen. Even though it's already happening, make sure it doesn't continue because this is horrible. This is really bad. And on our campus here, we have like a lot of infrastructure issues. We want to get this campus to look better, to improve our enrollment. We want our students, we want more students on this campus. We want you, these, continue, these graduates, these students who are graduating, to talk about maybe in the future or maybe talk about to their friends, oh, I, I, went, I got my degree at Laney College. It's a great college. It's got great, you know, great programs and everything, but we also want to keep it going. We want to keep our enrollment up. So if there's anything you guys willing to do, willing to, you guys want to come see anything, you know, see us at ASLC, let us know. Let me know. I'm right here for you. All right. hey, now we have Brittany Brown of the East 12th Street Coalition. Take it away, Brittany. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's really, it's really great being here. I really... Um, I'm excited and didn't, I was um, preparing last night, like, what am I gonna talk about? We're talking about how, we're talking about, you know, Flint and water, um, how am I going to make the connection to housing, right? Um, and I was inspired by, you know, what you said earlier, uh, Professor, you gave that lovely poem, corporate greed cannot de deny or define um, people's needs. I didn't say it verbatim, but something like that. Um, and so I, this, this struggle, East 12th, uh, the East 12th Coalition, what we've been dealing with has really been, it's, uh, corporate interests have set the tone, um, but just because they set the tone doesn't mean that we've allowed it to happen passively. And as we talk about displacement, I feel like a lot of the times it's talked about and framed as this, um, as this passive action or just this thing that happens to us passively. Um, the way in which we experience it is very violent. Um, in the process, you know, we die, we fight, we raise generations. Um, so just thinking about displacement and how corporate interests have, you know, set the tone for that. Um, so all these, yeah, really awesome connections. And then as far as like selling off our lands, right? So. A little bit of background about the East 12th Coalition and the East 12th Remainder Parcel. So there's like this huge chunk of like vacant, unused land. They put like, rent. PG e is using it right now and it's just like all these like weird steel pipes. Um, I'm sure you all have seen it driving down uh, East 12th. Um, has anybody heard about this show of hands? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been going on this, this kind of, 
this thing has been going on for about a year. Basically, the city was trying to sell this piece of land to, um, to a private developer, and the developer was going to build uh, luxury apartments for $3,100 for one bedrooms, right? Um, that's crazy. Who here can afford a $3,100 one bedroom? Okay. <laughs> I mean, no, but you have, I mean, you have to ask those questions. I mean, city council was for this and is still for this. Only one of our city council members voted against this, right? So, like, it's, it's a no-brainer, but still, they're, you know, they're for this and they think that it's for the community. Um, so, they were trying to sell it, backdoor deal, uh, $5 million, and even that $5 million, right, this is a public asset right by the lake and they're gonna sell this for $5 million to a developer who wants to, who wants to really profit off of it. So obviously it's worth more than what you're selling it for, right? Um, if a private investor is willing to develop on this land. So $5 million, they're trying to sell it. It's a backdoor deal. Um, community got wind of it, and um, you know, Black Lives, uh, Black Lives Matter came, became involved, um, as well as Black Seed, as well as um, Asians for Black Lives, and a ton of advocacy groups um, in the Bay Area, in Oakland, came together, came to a city council member council meeting and blocked the vote, right? Blocked it, shut it down. Um, that's been our tactic, direct action. <laughs> We've been shutting it down. Because um, they won't listen to us otherwise, right? It's unfortunate, but it's still kind of tight. Um, so we, we, we blocked the vote, um, and then the city said, okay. City council was like, well, we'll open it up. We'll open a RFP, which is a request for proposals, right? And so as I was getting into this work, I'm like, what the heck is an RFP, right? All this like really weird language that they use to shut us out the whole time. And I think what's, what's key to, to take away from this is that the community was disenfranchised by this process, right? Like using this weird language, scheduling these really weird meeting times, um, not even putting out a formal process, right? Just kind of selling it to um, a developer, trying to sell it to a developer. Um, and so that's not democracy, right? And this is our pub, this is public land. Um, w this land happened because of Measure DD. Um, Measure DD, we were able to raise close to $200 million because remember on 12th Street, there were six lanes those lanes, they did a lot of renovations. We've seen all the renovations. They did a ton of renovations um, on the lake. And so now there's less lanes, but there's more public space, right? And so that land was created through tax dollars. And now they were trying to sell it off um, to a private developer. So they opened the process up. We as a community group respond to this process uh, have a have a, a vision session. We called called it the East 12th wish list. This occurred in August of 2015, so last summer. Uh, we got 200 people to come out. They said what it is that they wanted, what it is that they wanted to see, what it is that they did not want to see. Uh, more importantly, and um, we submitted this to city to the city. We were one out of three, one out of four at the time, uh, folks who presented a proposal. So not only did we see, not only did we react, but we also were active in giving them an alternative, right? So um, we're moving forward. We submitted the proposal, and that that same private investor decided to pair up with an affordable housing developer, right? To make their, um, to make it more attractive. Like, oh, we don't have any affordable housing on this site. Let's find, let's go find an affordable housing developer to, uh, to back this deal, right? So again, public land, and we're, su we're subsidizing this because without, without an affordable housing developer backing it, you can't build anything because not only is it um, unethical, there's also, because it is public land, uh, there's a surplus land act in California, you see. 1970, it was passed, updated in 2014, and so, there's a law, right, written that says you cannot sell uh, surplus lands without prioritizing affordable housing. And that's really key, because right now, we are facing um, a housing crisis. Um, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it, and, and so you know, again, your city council members that you elected did not um, vote for this proposal. They went, uh, right now, at this moment, uh, after, 
back and forth, back and forth, being re-energized, um, going to city council meetings, uh, doing direct actions, they still, after we gave them a viable, right, economically viable proposal with 133 affordable housing units, uh, that could, and again, that's the, the shift, to shift the narrative. Not only do we have 133 affordable housing units, but we were able to, there's set, we can hold 762 people, right? Families, um, our elders, our children, youth, we can hold 762 people. Um, so when we talk about affordable housing, a lot of the times they're like, well, we just need to create more housing. But it's like, what type of housing are you creating? Are you creating studios? Are you creating one bedrooms? And how many people can this actually hold? Um, so again, sh shifting, shifting the narrative and um, supply and demand, which will not work in our, in our market and should not determine how we develop in Oakland. And just, just so you know, and I'm, sh I'm sure most folks know, we have a lot of development in the pipeline. Uh, and, a lot, and most of it, like 95% of it, is all market rate, which means it's like a $3,100 one bedroom. Um, all of that's in the pipeline. So it's like, oh, this is public land. Why do you need more market rate housing? It's already being developed and not being subsidized by our, by our own assets. So um, that's where I'll leave it with. I'm sure we'll have time for questions. And um, again, just really uh, blessed to be on this panel with you all. So to wrap up our panel discussion, uh, we have Dr. Kimberly King, formerly of Cal California State University, LA. She teaches psychology here. Please welcome Dr. King. Thank you. I'm really honored to be a part of this community panel with our water warrior from Flint and with Brittany Brown and with Alicia and Ethel Long Scott. I just wanted to say a few things as an Oakland native, as a faculty here at Laney, um, and as a uh, freedom fighter. Um, one thing, uh, the theme, I guess, is that student learning conditions are faculty and staff working conditions. You know, we are connected in this. And I borrow that saying from my uh, previous Cal State Union, the California Faculty Association. But um, one thing, since I've been here at Laney, um, it's been really a challenge to try to offer quality education. Um, the majority of our classrooms do not have computers and projectors. Now this is the 21st century, that's totally unacceptable. That's crazy. It's kind of like when Claire said, um, do they care about us? You know, do they care about us here at Laney? Do they care about our students? Do they care that they get a quality education? You know, do they care about the bathrooms? Do they care about that none of the microwaves work? Do they care about that the food is too expensive? I have, one, I have a classroom that doesn't have real doors on it. I have a classroom that has accordion door on one side and a glass door on the other side. So when my students, many of whom are learning in a, se a second language, some of whom have disabilities, are trying to take an exam. We hear faculty speaking on either side of the classroom. No offense, Nate, I know you got a nice loud voice. It's not your fault. He's a great professor. We need to have walls on our classrooms. There's, I talk to faculty almost every week about the things that we're struggling with. And I just saw an email, two emails this morning. The elevators are broken in the tower building. What? Both elevators are broken? We can't just get some kind of emergency fix? Oh, we put in an order to get it fixed. What? The other thing, um, they were doing, they're doing some type of construction while the students are trying to um, learn in their class. They're building some building. School ends in two weeks. Can they just wait? Can they do it on the weekend? Do they care about us? And just like the people of Flint came together, I don't know, you guys should really check out this Here's to Flint video on YouTube, Here's to Flint. It, we showed it at the beginning, but they had to get together with a professor at Virginia Tech. He got an emergency grant from the National Science Foundation, and the people themselves did testing of that water. 
Because why? Because the government, the EPA, the federal government wouldn't do anything about it. One guy tried to, and the city government wouldn't do anything about it. Well, the city government tried to also, but the emergency manager uh, reversed it. So um, we need to come together as students and faculty. We need to come together and say what it is that we want for our students, what it is that we want I don't like having those kind of working conditions. I want to be able to provide quality education for my students. That's why I'm here. And just to think that it's not just happening in Flint, the City College of San Francisco almost lost their accreditation, okay, by a corporate-driven accreditation agency, the ACCJC. Okay, they had what is called, you think emergency managers are funny, they had a special trustee with extraordinary powers that was appointed to run their school system instead of the elected board of trustees of students and uh, community members. What they did is they downsized that school. They said, you're serving too many students. What does that mean? If students want to get an education, shouldn't they be able to get an education? What's a community college for? They said, you're serving too many students. They said, you're, you're paying your faculty too much. Your adjunct faculty have too many rights. They said, they um, ins instituted, they forced the faculty to start instituting these push out policies like Alicia's talking about. If students don't have the money to uh, pay their registration, then they get kicked out of the class. Are you, guys, uh, are you guys having that experience here? If you don't pay by a certain time, you're out. Then the wait list is on and you might not get back in that class. You, now, I just heard the other day that um, students only can get financial aid for a certain number of amount of time like in their whole life. So then that means they're taking five classes at a time and working full time. How are you gonna get a decent GPA with that? They don't care, do they care about us? Do they care about us? So we live in the richest uh, state and the richest country in the world. Okay, so there's no reason Peralta doesn't have enough money, Laney doesn't have enough money, the state of California doesn't have enough money, Apple lives here. Wells Fargo, the foreclosure in chief, they live here. Uber. Uber lives here right in Oakland. So anyway, we're going to continue um, building, and I invite all of you all next Tuesday. We're going to continue our planning meeting for the teach-in next Tuesday at 2.30 up in the student office. And we're going to keep building and trying to see how we can come together, um, because we care about us even if they don't. So I know this is a lot of information that you've taken in. And a lot of times we kind of think all of these things are only happening to me and mine and my family. We are so miseducated in this country to believe that when we have suffering, we have poverty, we have these phenomenal things. We've heard the whole panel speak to us about how, wait a minute, it can't, all of these things, there's a pattern here. And it's important that we begin to know this. Uh, Claire raised in her comments that we have leaders um, who actually sounded the alarm, a particular leader that we want to make sure that you draw a beam on is uh, Reverend Edward Pinckney. He's a 68-year-old minister, and he is right now languishing in prison for, for a crime that he did not commit without evidence, without a jury of his peers, and for the crime basically of doing what we're doing right here at this panel, sounding the alarm about the theft of democracy and the theft of our resources by corporate America. Now, if we don't inform ourselves about those early leaders who dare to stand up, dare to not only resist but have a vision that we don't have to grovel on the ground and live like dogs in this rich, rich nation. I'm not the first one to say it, not the first one to say it, and I'm hoping that you all will make sure that we are not the last to say it. I think that it is so important. In this paper, some of you might have gotten it, um, Free Reverend Edward Pinckney. This man has been in jail for 503 days now. Maybe you, you know, on the back of each edition of the People's Tribune, and I know other people are going to speak about it, there, this man has written a paper for this. He's done the work that we've been doing for 20 years in Benton Harbor. So when you hear, well, you know, he must have did something wrong. I mean, they wouldn't have just jailed him for nothing. Wrong. <laughs> 
wrong idea, first probably person incarcerated uh, for going up against the emergency manager system as he fought Whirlpool. If you don't know about this, Google his name. I would ask you to do something more. Go to the website, uh, Justice for Pinkney, P-I-N-K-N-E-Y. Uh, go to the Banco website. This has a great deal to do with us because what we're learning is that they are developing a model in Michigan that they are then applying to all the rest of our cities and states. Yes, 19 states have an emergency manager, but they may not as have, even we had it here in Oakland, have, have versions of it here in Oakland. And we have still these thefts of democracy that are going on, but they don't have the full range that they have in Michigan. That's why we gotta learn how this new kind of 21st century fascism really is coming there. That's what he educated about. So we want to make sure that one, you lend your, first, teach yourselves. Second, that you stand up with this man and make sure to stand with the people of Flint and breaking the silence on this atrocity that is being conducted against working people who are poor, working people who may have jobs, but they are trying to steal every resource that we have. We've got to defend the leaders, the whistleblowers who are standing for our little rights because individually we can't beat them. But together, united with a vision and a strategy, we can do what they did in Flint. So uh, keep in your mind, teach yourselves about Reverend Edward Pinckney. Go to those websites, go to his Facebook site, learn about it, and, and elevate that struggle into your defense, into your education. And Oaktown, you know, it is time. We've got to get up off our knees. We've got to stop fighting individually. We've got to come together and figure out how do we take these rich resources of the Silicon Valley and apply them to raising our babies, apply them to a, 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 free, a, a free education and a climate and environment that, can, that all people can sustain and can, in fact, celebrate. That's what Reverend Pinckney was about. So think about him as you go forward in your work. Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay, what I would like to express is that like on Tuesday in my English class, we were looking at a video and it was showing uh, Ohio, the small schools there, and it was just really unbelievable. It's like they were filthy, the ceilings were falling in, the concrete was cracking, the roofs were leaking, water in the classrooms, where the children would have to put on their coats and boots and go to another area on the outside just to use the restroom. They had some schools where they could not even serve lunch for these children because they had no running water. It was dirty, filthy, they couldn't even feed them. So, you know, just imagine a child going to school with no breakfast, you know, and it was like in the rural areas and in the more or less poor areas, you know what I'm saying? But what I did notice is, is like uh, they had like, like downtown in the city, they put a lot of money into the schools where it was more or less suburban, where they had tennis courts, swimming pools, I mean computers, okay. everything you could imagine. And it was just horrible. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. So that's a small area, so just imagine, and I looked online at, on Detroit, they got bugs that's falling apart just the same way. It's horrible. I just want to bring that to everyone's attention because we have children and they, they are our future. And if they're not trained right, then we're hopeless as a planet, as a universe, even as America. We got people sleeping on sidewalks. I never saw that as a child, but I'm seeing it every day now. And if we don't do something, we're doomed. As a reader and writer for the People's Tribune, I'm interested in knowing how you use the photographs and articles uh, in a newspaper in taking out your case to the people who don't know about it or haven't yet activated. So how do you use the newspaper as one of your tools for, for building this movement and struggling? Well, uh, it's interesting you brought up the People's Tribune because the People's Tribune has helped been an anchor and a, a source of unity in Flint in the struggle because 
it covered the untold story long before the national media came on the scene. So I uh, encourage uh, everyone to uh, subscribe and read online. There's videos, there's interviews, and it goes way back before 2014 about the water wars in the state of Michigan, but especially following the emergency of this fascist model, we talked about the emergency manager. And the People's Tribune is also outstanding because it uses citizen photos, citizen articles, yes. citizen testimony for those, the voices of the movement. So I thank you for that question. Um, hello, thank you for being here. I have a question for uh, Brittany. Brittany, that's your name? Uh, okay. Oh, hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, I've been hearing about uh, workforce housing. Can you speak to uh, workforce housing in Oakland, which is um, housing for teachers and firemen? Uh, it's affordable housing, but it's mainly like middle class housing. Um, would you like to speak to that? Yeah, so, um, so with workforce housing, uh, to your point about uh, thinking about incomes and how affordability is, like how affordable housing is developed, right? Uh, the, the, the standards are set at the federal lo level um, by Housing HUD, which is a federal agency, uh, Housing and Urban Development. They set that standard. So they will look at median incomes and say, okay, we're going to subsidize, uh, we're going to give public dollars to uh, people who make, build housing for people who make below a certain threshold. And um, a lot of the times uh, people kind of, they make a little too much and way too less. And so they kind of uh, fall into this middle ground and workforce, ho workforce housing is a way to kind of um, address, address that gap. Uh, but it, it, it's, it could be a little divisive, right? Because if, that's, if we're saying that's workforce housing for a certain income, are we implying that like the people who actually qualify aren't workers as well? So um, just kind of understanding those, those, uh, those layers. And, and Urban Core, which is the private developer, used that, right, that, that uh, device to say, oh, well, the housing that this group is trying to build is for the low-income people. You won't qualify, so let's build this workforce housing for you. Let's build 11 units of workforce, of workforce housing um, for you. Does that answer your question? Okay. Uh -huh. Hi, yeah. I just want to say thank you to uh, the panelists. I, I also wanted to... Uh, kind of address the language that uh, Ms. Claire was talking about earlier, um, where the bottom line is, is the fact that they all want to just make money and that we're irreplaceable, this idea that we are irreplaceable. And I think um, I want to say that we're not because we actually make the cities work, right? We, they need us to be working and cleaning the streets and doing, to, we already make society function the way that it does because we are the working class and Flint, a lot of people I'm sure don't know the history of Flint because there used to be a lot more uh, uh, plants in Flint and possibly that's the reason why the Flint water is polluted now. Um, and I just think it's important that we have to go back and think about the fact that as working people, the fact that we have to work to come to school, we have to work to, to live, to survive, is a saying that we actually make the society function and we should make it function for ourselves because we do already make it function for ourselves. We shouldn't allow us to think that we're like dispensable. We need to really say that we matter in this world and we really should make it work for ourselves. And I just think it's important to, um, to, to have that mindset in mind. And I think it's great that there's so many young people here and 
we should, we should uh, try to unify to do something about that because we all have to work one day and we're all gonna have to. Anyway, thank you. Yeah, I, I agree with that and I kind of disagree with that. We are, as human, you know, as people, we have, well, no, we have to work, we have to do other things, but if you want to get your stance across, go, like I was saying earlier, go to your city council, go to your mayor, go to your, go to your officials and let them know what, what's bugging you, because if they, if you don't do it, they don't listen. Same thing, if you have a problem with, like I said, I know I want to get too personal, but if you have trouble with a certain um, thing on campus, go to, go, go, go to the officials on here on campus and let them know what's going on. Go to your instructors, go to your deans, go to anybody and let them know what's going on. You are a student. We, are, we as students, we matter. Laney, lives matter. Hey. Hey. Yes, I want to thank her for that comment and I want to just uh, kind of expand on what you're saying about the working class people that built this country and built our city and being the home of General Motors, we're also the home of the great sit-down strike that put labor on the map. We are a proud city. We have a rich history for social justice and labor rights. And we are going through a traumatizing experience because of plant closings, uh, capital flight overseas, electronic revolution replacing manual labor, yes. and we, as I mentioned before, are growing into a class of dispossessed workers, disposable workers. We're not needed for the production process, and therefore, what do, do our lives matter anymore? That's the question, it's a revolutionary question when we say Flint lives matter because we are no longer building cars and trucks. One of the mantras in uh, Flint, and you've probably heard it advertised, Buick would say when better cars are built, Buick will build them. That was one of their marketing slogans. And we say when better cars are built, robots will build them. Uh -oh. And my dad that worked in at Fisher Body in Flint, Michigan, and it was seven of us, and we never went hungry one day in our life. We had health care, dental care, this care, that care. But as time moved on and electronic production took place, my dad said, well, if you're going to use robots to build the cars, who going to buy them? That's a revolutionary question. So when we say it's a revolutionary question, then we're talking about reconstruction of a society, reconstructing society, and put it in line to service and feed the human soul and human needs. And that's the direction that we're going to have to take. Thank you. <laughs>